I don't see an MC here, so I'm going to be my own MC. Um, if it gets weird, I speak in the third person, just go along with it. It's totally natural. Um, your next speaker is Kelsey Hightower from CoreOS. Uh, he'll be speaking about uh, containers at scale with Kubernetes. It probably won't be, really be at scale. There'll probably be four VMs in this talk, but just go with it. So with that, let's give Kelsey a big warm applause. All right, so um, again, managing containers at scale uh, with Kubernetes and CoreOS. Uh, the idea here is what I want you to keep in mind during the duration of this talk is how would you design your infrastructure if you could never log in, right? Let's say we're starting over from scratch, throw away all the legacy, all the production problems, if you work in the enterprise, all those issues, how would you do it, right? If we could repeat this process knowing what we know now. So one thing is abstraction. Um, we have all these runtimes, varying degrees of VM, some are compiled, some have tons of dependencies. So the first step that we would do is we would try to provide some abstraction, right? What do we call an application? What we don't want to do is treat a collection of runtimes and treat them all special, deal with the deployment processes, because we really don't care. What we really want to do is just have a single way to describe an application. So one good use of that is containers. Um, a lot of you raised your hand that you were aware of Docker. So Docker is unique take on containers, mainly because it comes with an image format. So many people have been using containers for a while, but when Docker hit the scene is when we start to get this image that you can share around. So if you're familiar with a typical Linux distribution, you've always had this idea of a package, and you can name it, you can version it, you can share it with other people. And that's what we get with containers. And the thing we're talking about here are application containers, right? So we're not trying to shove SSH we're not shoving more than one process. The goal here is to keep one application per container. And then we just focus on our application and the dependencies. So depending on your language, your dependencies can be as big as a runtime, some dynamic libraries, or if you're writing something like Golang, it could be a statically linked binary and that, that's all you have. The other thing is the runtime environment. So ideally you want things like C groups so you can contain and restrict CPU and memory utilization. And you also want to give your processes their own view of the world via namespaces. So, and we'll see how we have our own IP space and mount space using Kubernetes and Docker underneath the hood. When I set this up, here's what I mean by a process. So when a lot of people talk about containers, um, there can be some confusion about what goes in your container. So really quick, we'll be using this demo application called Hello World. And Hello World will connect to Redis and do a few things with Redis, but its overall goal, goal is to respond to Hello World. It has a health check endpoint, so when it launches, I can be sure that it's healthy. And that health check endpoint will ping Redis to make sure its dependency is available online. And we'll see this a little bit later. And in this case, since this is Golang, in order to start to package this up, the first thing you would normally do is build this, right? So I'm on my Mac, and I'll compile it. So what I'm going to end up with is a static binary. So if I run this Hello World app, yeah, I need permission. I'm going to run this application. And it's just a normal process. Let's hit on port 80. And we'll test things out just to make sure it works. Right, it says Hello World. And if we get the version from it, we're versioning version 1.0, which is great. And if I were to hit the health check endpoint, health Z is my endpoint, I get this error, right? So I get a non-200 because Redis isn't running. This is what I want, and I need this abstraction to make it easy for things like Kubernetes to be able to tell if my app is up. What I don't want to do is go create a bunch of Nagio scripts to reverse engineer the app. The app should tell me it's healthy by hitting this health endpoint. So whatever it means to be healthy, if I hit this endpoint, it should do. So right now it's complaining about Redis. So what we'll do is we'll stand up Redis really quick. Redis server. So now that Redis is running, we try the health endpoint, and we get a 200 and no error back. So this is our process that we essentially want to put inside of our container. So since it's a normal process, the next thing we need to do, today Docker primarily works only on Linux, so what we need to do is get this binary ready for Linux. So we'll just do go OS equals Linux, so we can get a cross compile here. So we'll build this, and now we'll end up with a statically linked binary that we can just shove in the container. So the nice thing about um, my dependencies being encapsulated this way, I end up with this you know, slightly big 2.4 or 6.4 megs. But if you look at my Docker file, it's very tiny, right? I'm not importing an operating system to build layers on top. I'm just going to copy in my binary. That's all I need. So in order to build this, if you've never dealt with Docker before, we can call 
uh, Docker build. And normally we give it a tag, um, and we usually name it after our repository. So I'm going to store this one on Google's compute registry. So they have a container registry. And then I give it a, a username, Kubernetes up and running, and I'll name the binary Hello World. And you probably want to do some semantic versioning, right? So that way we can keep track of what container we're running, and we hit build. What happens here, it uploads our binary to Docker. Docker does its build process, and what we end up is an image. So now that we have this image, if I were to do Docker list or Docker images, we see that we have this image, and it's almost the exact same size as the binary that I put in it. So now I have this application that just works as a normal process, one app per process, and I will have this image that I can push to a registry, and then I'm ready to start using a system like Kubernetes to deploy it. So this is what I mean by a container. I'm only encapsulating so I can actually use other tools to manage the particular application. No RPMs, no devs, no tarballs. So Kubernetes comes into play. So now that we have these containers, we need a way of managing it, right? So if you start off with containers, normally you point to one single host, and you say, hey, run Hello World for me. If I add a second host, it gets a bit challenging. How do you know what to run where? How many copies need to run where? That's where things get confusing. So in Kubernetes world, what we really want is a collection of machines. Now, we don't name these machines any fancy names. We don't care what their IP addresses are, really. We just want their CPU and their memory resources. That's all we're concerned about. So effectively, Kubernetes will take this list of machines and treat them as one logical machine, right? And that's where some of the distributed computing concepts come in. In this talk, we won't have time to go deep into the details, but we'll touch on some of them as we go. Ideally, on these machines, we need a couple of things. We need Docker, so we can create the containers. But more importantly, we need the Kubernetes agents. The kubelet is responsible for owning the server. Imagine taking a server and being able to slice up its resources, containers, networking, and mount. And we abstract that by having the kubelet live there, and we can give it manifest to tell it what to do. Now, how we get it to manifest? Well, before we, we get manifest, we have this concept of pods. So what I built earlier was a container, one app. But my container also needs a helper process, Redis. How do I deploy those at the same time? If you're familiar with scheduling, if I were to schedule both of those, there's a chance that one can land on one machine, one can land on another machine. That would be problematic. Then I will have to glue them back together. So in Kubernetes, we do have this concept of a pod. We can logically construct an application from one or more containers. So I can create a pod with Redis and my Hello World app and have them join and be in the exact same namespace, and they can address each other over localhost. They do share ports, so there can be chances for port conflicts, but it's much, rare, much less rare than just having every uh, one share an IP address. Once we have our pods, we can give them to schedulers. So you as a user, you as an application developer, you can design a pod manifest and submit it to the scheduler. And the scheduler's job is to score the systems in a cluster and choose the best fit and based on the best fit, it'll run your pod. Everything in your pod is an atomic transaction to the scheduler. So if you need Hello World and Redis, it goes at the exact same time. And the scheduler is pluggable. So if you don't want to use the one that comes with Kubernetes, you're free to stop it and run your own scheduler, watch the endpoint for unbound pods, and you have the access to all the view of the machines that you can make your own scheduling decision. The next concept is a replication controller. So if you deploy a pod, it'll be scheduled, but if it goes down, there is no babysitter process to care about keeping that running. And pods are great for one-shot jobs, right? If you have a batch process, you want to just run a job into a completion, use a pod. But if you have a long-running service, like a web app, you want to use a replication controller. And a replication controller will basically take a pod template and stamp out as many copies as you specify. So in this case, we say we want three. So we can go from one to three, and what happens is the replication controller talks to the central API. The central API is the coordination set for everything else. So the replication controller watches the API server and looks for unbound pods. So they cooperate. They never talk to each other. Replication controller also handles things like self-healing. So since we declared that we want three in a cluster, if one of the machines underneath were to go away, we can reschedule the pod. So we don't move it like a virtual machine. We just reschedule it using the same template that we launched the other unit. Now, once you have all of these pods running around in your cluster, since we do not interact with the local machine's IP, each pod has its own IP address. If a pod were to move or be rescheduled, it gets a new IP address. 
So the next challenge then is how do you actually find the applications running inside your cluster? And this is where service discovery comes in, and we'll see this during the demos. And with the services, the key concept in Kubernetes is this concept of labels. So you can draw out what a service means at runtime. So when we launch our pod, we can say it's the hello app. And then we can have a set of services which will give us a virtual IP or a virtual port. And if we were to hit that virtual IP on any of the machines, it will do a lookup in the API server to find all of the backend pods that can fulfill any request. All right, so that's what we see. That's the last slide, right? So we're gonna to try to do the rest of this live. Demo gods, please, anyone that's religious, please give me a prayer, and uh, we hope this works. So even though the machines are important, this is kind of a glimpse of my cluster. I have four machines, um, some amount of memory, and some CPU. But we won't care about that too much, and we won't refer to it. If I forget my commands, I do have my cheat sheet, and I will use it, so don't judge me. <laughs> All right, so the first thing we want to do is now that we have our container image, we want to um, start to deploy it. So everything in Kubernetes is declarative. There are some commands that will allow you to do imperative things, like, hey, run this one container, but that's not what we really want to do. We want to have this concept of, here's my declaration. We take that declaration, we submit to the API server. The API server is completely stateless. It stores all of its data in etcd. Now, the fact that it's stored in etcd is where we get the idea of consensus, we go through raft, and we make sure that the entire cluster view sees the exact same set of data. And all the other components rely on this fact to be true. As long as that's true, we can continue to work this way. So here we start with a bunch of replication controllers. Here's what the uh, V1 replication controller looks like. So here's a definition. Say we want to use API version 1. We want a replication controller. Now everything has labels, even replication controllers. You can have many replication controllers in a cluster. This replication controller's name is Hello World V1, and it has this specification. Right now I'm saying I want one copy of this pod template. Now the selector says, I as a babysitter will scan the cluster looking for pods that have this label set. If I find the total amount, I will do nothing. If I see zero and I want one, I will create one. How will I create one? I will create one from this template. This template says, create a pod, give it three labels, app equals hello world, track equals stable, version v1. And here's the containers that should go in the pod, right? I want my hello world, and then I have a liveliness probe. It's the same help check that I hit earlier on my machine. And that help check will be responsible for testing all of its dependencies. I don't care what it is. If you're an application developer, if you follow a pattern like that, just make every system man's life easy. I don't know what your dependencies are, you do. I hit that endpoint, you handle it, you tell me that they're all healthy. And in this case, it would hit Redis, which will run inside the exact same pod. Right? So now that we have this pod definition, we can store it, we can check it in. I can use kubectl to create the pod. So kubectl create rc hello world v1. So what will happen here, and I'll let you guys see what my events look like. What's happening here is that we're scheduling out the pod. So we create this replication controller. It's a bit, a bit noisy here. So up here we create a replication controller. And then what happens is, really quick, the scheduler picks it up. Here's the scheduler's log. And it successfully signs um, one of the pods created to the template to one of my nodes. Here it says it got assigned to node 1. So once I do that deployment, so you get all these audit logs if, you, if anything goes wrong. If I were to do get pods, we'll see that we have one pod running, right? If I were to delete this pod, kubectl, delete pods, now, if I delete this pod, the replication controller will get really upset at the cluster and create another one, right, with a different name. Because the specification is that you want run running at all times. And we don't care where it runs. Now, if we were to look at this pod, kubectl, describe pods, if I were to describe this pod, we'll see that it gets its own IP address, right? So we see that there's two containers here, Redis and Hello World. And we also notice that we get our own IP address. So this gives the ability to have our applications decoupled from the machine. The machine is no longer important. The app is. Unfortunately, this is a private IP. So you with networking, if I hit that, I get nothing. It doesn't route anywhere, right? And we'll see how we solve this later. So now that I have that replication controller online, uh, there's things you can do with a replication controller. 
Now, since the API server has a global view of everything, if I want to communicate with that pod, I can actually use commands to do so. So let's get our pods again. If I want to actually talk to that pod, even though I don't have a routable IP, I can use port forwarding from the API server to redirect me to wherever that pod's running and give me a way to communicate. So let's try that really quick. So kubectl, um, we want to do a port forward. And what we want to do with our port forward is we want to take this pod, right, and we want to map port 10,000 to port 80. Yeah, I'm sure it's not. All right, dash P. Okay, so what happens here, it will talk to the API server, locate the pod, and establish a link between the two and start forwarding traffic from my port 10,000 to port 80 inside that container. Now, since there's multiple containers, we can choose to proxy any port that we want. So if this all works, what we should be able to do is we should be able to do curl 127.0.0.1 port 10,000, and we get Hello World back. Right, so you do not need to log onto the system to troubleshoot these things, unless the API server's down. Right, so now that we have that in place, we can cut that out. And the next thing you may want to do is run ad hoc commands. Right, so in my Hello World container, there is no OS, there is no runtime. I can't run any commands in there. But the Redis container does, it actually has bash. It has a user land. So what I can do there is I can run commands. So kubectl get pods, kubectl exec one of these pods. So we'll take this pod, and if I wanted to, we can talk to a specific container with dash C, and we'll say the Redis container, and what I want to do is call a command, uname dash A, right? So that goes, finds the pod, and gives me a way to interact with the pod by running any ad hoc command that I want. So this just shows me that it's running on CoreOS with kernel version 4.2. So the thing about containers, they share the kernel with the host. And if you need to troubleshoot logs, you can also do that. So if I wanted to look at the logs, I can also do the same thing. So I can also use kubectl, run the logs command, and I get a dump of the logs. So this is, this is the Redis logs from that particular container. So you have all these troubleshooting abilities because we have all the data we need to troubleshoot the cluster in a central location. All right, now so that we have our application deployed, we, we basically have solved the problem of automated deployments. But the biggest issue for most people is not automating things. Most people have tools that automate their data center. The biggest problem for most people, and they don't know it, is resource utilization. You ask people, they say, it's entirely automated. We have thousands of servers. And you say, what is your utilization? And you're like, well, under 10%. That is a serious waste of cash. Right? If you're in Amazon or EC2, you make them a ton of money. They may, not even, they may just stop selling books because of this problem. So one way I illustrate this to people is like, hey, resource utilization is not a problem. So okay, cool, let's, let's play a game. How many people have ever played Tetris? Cool, the rest of you, you probably had a very sad childhood. <laughs> <laughs> but Tetris is, I think, a good way to illustrate resource scheduling. So what I want you to do is when you see the blocks, think of them as different shape workloads. And we're going to play a game. The first game we're going to play is one without a resource scheduler. So people say, man, my environment is dope. It's fully automated and it's fast. Okay, it's fast, so we'll go to level nine. It's fully automated. And then they say, we can do one-click deploys. I'm like, that's pretty impressive. How many people here can do one-click deploys? Like that guy, you guys should meet these guys at lunch. But here's what one-click deploy looks like, because it's very theatrical when they show you. It's like, all right, you ready? We're gonna one-click deploy. So you hit one click, and then you do nothing else, right? And you let your system, as you scripted it out, attempt to utilize your data center efficiently. And this is what you end up with. It's totally automated though, which is dope. <laughs> but you just wasted all your resources. Most people don't even know, right? So they just buy more machines. So one thing we can do is we can actually play the game with our eyes open. Now, I don't expect a human to do this, so don't go to work, delete your scripts, and like start manually deploying things, right? Don't do that. You don't need to do that. There's computers that can do that for you. So here's what Kubernetes and other schedulers like Mesos do, especially when they have resources in mind. So given a number of predicates, if we include CPU and memory, we can actually play the game a little better. So one of the things that Kubernetes does is it's going to be a little slower, mainly because it has to examine um, multiple dimensions to make a, a scheduling decision. And depending on your, what your requirements are, it could take longer, especially as the number of nodes increases, right? 
But overall, what you end up with is, in the simple case, you end up with the strategy of bin packing. So even though most people look at it for the first time, it's like, why is Kubernetes putting all the things on specific servers? This makes no sense. I'm confused by the decisions that it's making. The truth is, what it's trying to do is trying to even out and defrag the cluster. So what we want to do is utilize resources, try to make a scheduling decision as fast as we can. We leave room, and when the right piece shows up, we put it in the right place. And that's the idea of bin pack, and there's other scheduling algorithms that you can do with Kubernetes. Most people look at that and say, I can't use that in my infrastructure. No way. Like, I'm not what it is, greenfield versus brownfield. So if you have an existing infrastructure, it is a bit tougher, right? You have existing applications, and you're not starting from ground zero. But if you move some of your workloads over, so in Kubernetes, when you add nodes to the cluster, you can actually say, I only want to allocate half of the resources. So your existing deployment tools can continue to work in their space, and that's your stuff down there at the bottom. And then Kubernetes can start filling in the blanks because it can actually start to utilize data coming real time from the machines. And it will still implement its strategies. And over time, as you move more and more workloads over to Kubernetes, you start to deflag the cluster. Right? So these things can actually be bolted on and run side by side by adding your nodes and giving them a limited view of resources that they commit to the scheduler. Now, some of you work at the enterprise. How many people work in the enterprise? Right? And they won't let you think or do any innovation without an initiative. There might be hope, right? So if you're in the enterprise um, and all your stuff is written in Java and you have to deploy to Oracle, okay, so the odds are kind of stacked against you, right? So most people say, look, I have this situation. What can you do for me? And I have to be honest with them. There is nothing Kubernetes could do for you <laughs> if you have that particular setup. <laughs> All right. So that's resource scheduling. It's actually important. Um, the goal is that you need to understand how your infrastructure is operating. And these resource schedulers are designed to do this. So it's not about just automated deployments. It's also about effectively using the resources that you commit to the cluster. All right, so the next thing we want to do is now that we have a conscious around resources, let's look at what Kubernetes, what tools Kubernetes gives us to handle this and view this. So one thing that I have in my cluster right now is the idea of a quota. So everything in Kubernetes is declared. So here's my strange loop quota set. And here I'm saying I can use 12 CPUs and 48 gigs of RAM. Now one thing about a cluster that you also want to avoid taking tiny workloads on expensive nodes. Right? If you just want to run your IRC bouncer and you want like one mega RAM, I cannot have you out taking up resources from this particular pool. Because if you notice down here, I'm limiting this to 120 pods. So if I get 120 IRC bouncers, I'm going to waste a ton of memory and a ton of CPU because the scheduler is going to say, based on that predicate, I have no more room in this particular namespace. So we want to reject things. So in Kubernetes, we also have this concept of limits. So limits here would be, if anyone gives me a workload that's smaller than this, I will reject it. If you give me a workload that's higher than that at the top, I'll reject it. If you give me nothing, I will actually decorate the request in the API and store it with the minimal set. So that way we have some resources to make the scheduler happy. And you may have noticed it because we didn't see it before. But if I were to get pods, kubectl get pods, We'll see from this pod, if I were to describe it, kubectl describe pods, we'll see that it was decorated when I deployed. So notice the memory and CPU limits there. And a nice thing about using C groups, if one of those processes were to run away, only it will run out of memory and be restarted. And Kubernetes will give you logs to say that one process in the pod was restarted for violating its memory and CPU allocation. The nice thing about that is it protects the rest of the system. So if you do resource allocations across the board, the scheduler will actually do a good job of efficiently scheduling things everywhere. And you won't have these weird issues where you have this one runaway JBoss process that takes down the entire server and you can't log in. Protect it with C groups, and you can avoid some of those things. All right? So that's the tool that it gives us. So once we have that tool, it's easier to start scaling out. So now the scheduler will make sure that we allocate enough memory and CPU for each process. So now that we have one pod running, and we remember we have this template. So we do kubectl scale, the replication controller called hello world, v1. And now what we can do is change the definition. We can say, you know what, we want replicas to be five. 
So what we'll do now, we'll go to the API server and we'll turn the knob on the definition of replica. So we go from one to five. The replication control is going to observe this change by doing a watch on its endpoint and see that there's a change. And then it's going to examine the cluster and ask for pods, realize that there are four missing from the declaration and add them. So it's fully declarative, doesn't matter what hosts are in or out of the cluster at the time this is made. So now they're all up and running. And I know everything is healthy because Kubernetes will not add the pods to my view until they pass their liveliness check. And this is why that help Z endpoint is very important so you don't chase things around. So now that everything is scaled out, we have a problem still. The problem we have is that they all have private IPs. How do we deal with these things? Well, you can build load balancers that talk to the API server and pull out a query to say, hey, give me all of the pods that have these sets of labels or come from this replication controller. But one thing we can do in Kubernetes, we can utilize a service. So what we can do is create a service. So here's the Hello World service. And what this service says here is that um, it has its own name and labels, but the specification is what's important here. What it wants to do is find any pod that has labels app equals Hello World. If you have that, you will show up in its backends. And then when it finds it, I want to allocate a node port. And I'm doing this because in this demo, I won't be putting a load balancer in front. I'll just be um, round robining across the nodes. So I can get a high port on my nodes and this is pretty critical for people like an Amazon or if you have traditional load balancing gear, they may only be able to address the IPs on the network and may not have routes into the actual container IP space. And here we're going to proxy from no port 36,000 to port 80 in the container. Remember, we can have multiple ports available in that container, so we need to be specific. So what I do now is I can create the service. So we'll create the hello service. And once we create the service, it gives me this warning. Depending on the number of nodes you have, now all of them are now intercepting traffic on port 36,000 for this service across the board. If you were to delete this, they remove it. Now how this works is Kubernetes has a binary called the proxy that runs on every single node. It also watches the API server for commands and endpoints like this. It observes them in the store, and then it goes and creates an IP table rule that says, Anything that shows up on port 36,000, redirect to me. Once it gets to me, I'll do a lookup in the API server for all the pods that have the labels in my selector. If we were to describe this, so kubectl get services, so SVC for short, what we can do is describe this. So kubs describe, um, we want to describe services and hello world. Right? So notice the number of endpoints that it located. So we have three plus two more, right? And these are all the things that return from the label query. So what happens if we go to scale this? So if we go from five to 10, we go through the routine of creating templates, unbound pods, and then they get scheduled, they find a home. And then what happens is once they become healthy, they show up as back in tier. So we see three plus four more. The others are out of view until they pass their liveliness check. Once the liveliness check is passed, what we'll see is they all show up, right? And this is near real time because they're all watching um, the API server. So we'll scale that, that back down to five. So once we have this, we have port 36,000, I'm free to hit any of the hosts and service discovery, the proxy will take over. So if I do uh, G Cloud, let's just do G List, my little shortcut here. It'll list all my nodes in my cluster. I'll grab any one of these public IPs. It doesn't matter if the pod's running on the host or not. It will always redirect me to where I need to be. So I take this, and what should work is curl uh, this IP 36,000. Hello world, right? So we'll just leave this running. So let's just get the version now. All right, so let's do wow chew do curl, and then we'll sleep for a moment, the ultimate hack, then we'll be done. All right, and we'll bump that up a little bit. So the customer is now hitting our 1.0 service of Hello World. It's healthy, we have this proxy in front. So now we are free to scale this out. If we were using a load balancer, we would just put all the nodes in the back end and let the load balancer figure out health of the actual node. Or we can actually do some integrations where we integrate load balancers directly to the API server to get the same query.
So once we have this model, the next thing we can do is leverage a pattern for deployment called the canary pattern. How many people have heard of the canary pattern? Great. So Kubernetes makes it really easy to implement the canary pattern. Since we're using labels, we can carve out a set of things that we proxy to. So right now, our service is not really that restrict or that strict. It says, if you just have app equals hello world, I will send you traffic. So that means we can create another replication controller. And we'll call this one canary. It looks the same, so I won't review all of it. The only difference here is that it will spin up the image 2.0. It has a different set of labels. So instead of track equals stable, track equals production. And this is so both replication controllers don't fight each other. Right? You don't want them spinning up and, and, and um, screwing up the cluster. So what we do is we give them something separate so that they can view the containers that they're responsible for. And here, I'm going to have a specification of one. So if I create this, notice one thing that it also meets the criteria for the current Hello World service, app equals Hello World. So if I deploy this, what should happen? Create-f replication controllers Hello World canary. If I create this, we go through the same song and dance. It will be created. We look at the number of pods, get pods. We see that the canary is now running, right? It'll refresh itself, letting me know that two of two pods are ready. And if we look and see what the customer sees, do you see the canary here? So 2.0 gets stuck into our traffic, right? Because the service is proxying to both when it does this label query. It also matches. Now, some people will say, well, what if we have a specific customer that only wants to see the new stuff and not the old? Again, using the labels, we can also carve out another set. All we have to do is be a little bit more strict in the new set. So if we look at our services here, Hello World, Canary, we'll be a little bit more strict. We'll allocate a different port so we can have um, a different path. And then what we'll do is say, you know what? To meet the criteria in our selector, you must also have a label called track equals Canary. You can add labels to pods on the fly, even at runtime. And that way, um, you can have the services pick up those pods if you're doing any troubleshooting or you're trying to expand. So if we create this, kubectl create-f service hello world canary, what we end up with is now a new service portal or a service port for this. So I'll stop this. And now those customers are free to hit port 36001 and what they should see is 2.0 no matter what, because that's the only thing being returned from that particular label query, right? And the way those work, get pods. So we see now with no queries, we get all the pods. If you do kubectl get, get svc, we see the label queries that are actually being made behind the scenes by our services. Let's try that again. So if we were to do git pods, kubectl, git pods, dash l, and I'm just going to copy the selector. So show me all the pods that have hello world. And we get them all. If we do the same thing, but we use a different set of label queries, or labels in our query, we get different output. Well, there's nothing called pp equals hello world, so no match. But if we add app there, and we only get one result. And that's how the whole system works, right? So once you have those things in place, the next thing you want to do is you're happy with the canary. Let's go back to running our normal app. So the canary is out there. There are no issues. What's the next thing you want to do once you have a canary out there? You want to roll the cluster to the version that matches the canary. So what we'll do is we'll stage up v v2 of our Hello World service. So Hello World v2. So in v2, what we do is we have a different version label. So that way, this replication controller does not conflict with the other. And then we also update the specification. We want the image to be 2. And I preserve my replication set. Now, there's a way to actually patch the current replication controller and just say you want to update the image. But we'll just keep it declarative and submit a new uh, controller to the cluster. So what we'll do here is we'll do a rolling update. So this is what the customer sees. And Kubernetes tries its best to not drop any traffic by giving time uh, for the proxy to finish a request, removing it, and then adding something new. It's healthy, then adding it. So hopefully we don't see any drops in this. So what we want to do now is a rolling update. Great, so my history. So what I'm saying here is kubectl 
I want to run the rolling update command. Every, five, every half second, I want to kill the pod and let the other one increment up by one. So we'll just start to tune the knobs, down one, up one, until we roll the entire cluster to meet the new specification. Dash F points me to the specification I want to be new. And then at the end, hello world, dash B1 is the name of the existing replication controller I wanted to replace. So when I hit enter here, what's happening is we go through this loop and we start to dial up and down both of the replication controllers. What we see here in our notes is we see things being killed, things being scheduled, things being started. So if you want to do monitoring in Kubernetes, you can actually process all of these events into an event system, or you can actually grab logs directly from the containers themselves, but all of this data is available to you. So we know that the cluster is working. If we take a view and see what the customer is looking at, we see that we're starting to get 2.0 a lot more often in our requests. We're almost at 50-50 here. We're still not dropping anything, which is great. We have one more to go. So on the old controller, we still have one replica in place. On the new controller, we now have four. And over time, as these things become healthy, we should have the entire cluster roll to 2.0. So there's still one scraggler out there. Let's see if we're done yet. So we're down to zero and, one, and five. And what we've asked is the cluster to replace it. So hello world v1 should be deleted as the final step at the end of the loop. And if this works, we have 2.0 across the cluster. And with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you.